Powered by Go Goat Sports in partnership with TSN, it is Season 4, Episode 69 of the Rain Riggs Podcast. It is our Stanley Cup Final Preview, and it is presented by our title sponsor, Canadian Club Whiskey. A uh, lot going on in my world, right? It's Wednesday as we record this. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, you're just coming off uh, a playoff run, and I'm heading to Kamloops this afternoon for the Memorial Cup, so kind of looking forward to that. Um, great hockey city. Really a, a terrific history in that city yeah. uh, for junior hockey. And uh, it, you better get there by the weekend or else Patrick Waugh's beard's going to be down by his feet. <laughs> He's um, a scruffy looking dude right now. <laughs> he could just trim that up just a smidge. But um, really, the, the Memorial Cup such a great tournament. I get to play in it once and uh, we won it in Portland. And uh, that was the first year that um, the whole city got a buy into the tournament. And right, it kind of right, changed right. the the whole view of how that tournament could be run. So, yeah, it's a it's a great tournament, and uh, you'll have fun out there. A lot of hockey you people know. will be there. Oh, and some good teams too, right? Yes, West, good. East, Quebec, all well represented in this year's uh, edition of the Memorial Cup on TSN. Headlines on the Rain Dregs Hockey Podcast are brought to you by our friends at Tim Hortons. All right, we are going to spend a fair bit of time in this episode doing what I mentioned right off the top, previewing the Stanley Cup final. We've got Chris Abbott, who stops by from Botano.ca, and he's going to look at the gambling version of what this series looks like. And man, there's so many different ways that you can play this out on Botano.ca. And Gary Lawless, uh, insider with the Vegas Golden Knights, formerly of TSN, will also stop by and We'll take a look at uh, kind of the inner workings of the Golden Knights going into this championship final as well. But first in the headlines, Ray, some of the news of the week. <clears throat> Brad Trilliving expected to be hired this week as Toronto's new general manager. I mean, we're dealing in the semantics, the nuance of where this is, right? Um, contract negotiations and all of that. But Trilliving is the GM, the man selected. Do you think it's a good fit? based on what you know of Brad Trillip. Yes, and given what Brendan Shanahan said at the press conference, I mean, it was it became a pretty narrow field in a hurry. Yeah. Because Shanahan laid out his parameters. So, you know, I would assume that when they made that decision to move away from Kyle Dubas, it wasn't with a blank... A blank um, a blank sheet of paper in front of him. Yeah. There were already some roads that he was going to drive down trying to narrow sure. in on, yeah. you know, I, I, I mean, he basically described Brad in the press conference, whether it was going to be Brad or somebody else, but he was basically describing an experienced guy, someone that could handle the market, somebody that could, um, you know, manage a, a big group, which is what Toronto is. What what I find interesting here, and I think it's the same, and whether it's Toronto or whoever gets a new general manager, the team instantly will change because the new manager's view will not be the same as the old manager, or they would have kept the old manager. Right. And so whatever what whatever Brad Trilliving's view is of what this team can be, it will be different than Dubas's. It just mm -hmm. will. And now how do you achieve that? That's that's going to be the next interesting part. Yeah. Well, and then the, the, the follow-up questions are, are pretty obvious, aren't they? I mean, it it's it's not just about Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner and William Nylander, Nylander and Matthews. The most significant issues because of, of contract, you do have to have a look at Sheldon Keefe as head coach mm -hmm. of the Maple Leafs. That would be natural, normal for any new GM. But I always say the same thing, and I want your opinion on this. Um, I think Sheldon Keefe's a good coach. Is there somebody better available? Maybe. I mean, but there are teams who are also in the market that don't have head coaches mm -hmm. like Calgary, like Anaheim, like the Columbus Blue Jackets. So if you're thinking of a, a Travis Green or a Gerard Gallant, uh, you better get at it in a hurry because those guys are likely going to be snapped up. How would, would, would head coaching of the Toronto Maple Leafs be a priority assessment for you if you're Brad Trilliving going in? 
Yes. I mean, to me, it would be um, priority only because the people you might want to talk to if you wait a month might not be there anymore. But just like I said, you know, Shanahan basically started the process with names on paper. Like it's, you don't just let somebody go and say, Oh gee, now I got to start looking around. Every manager I've ever talked to has a, I'll say a book, but that's not really what I mean, but research into what different coaches around the league and in the game are about. They they have their own, I'll call it a book. They have their own book on it. So there are people that Brad for living probably thinks really highly of. And he would only know Sheldon Keefe from afar. Yes. Yeah. But he's not going to get the job, sign the paper and say, gee, I got to start thinking about the coach. Like, like this is already moving. For sure it is. And so like, I, I suspect that decision would be pretty quick. There's two ways to look at it. One is, yes, he's got to bring in his own guy or two. That's, that's always um, a safety catch for a manager is mm-hmm. you keep the incumbent coach and it might work. Mm-hmm. Or you keep that coach and it doesn't work. And then you haven't done anything yet. You, you there's, there's nothing on you yet. Right. You get to move mm-hmm. on the coach yeah. Yeah. somewhere else down the line. Does that impact the Matthews negotiation and all that? Maybe, probably. Maybe. What, so everybody speaks of the, Matthew's negotiation as the priority, quite frankly, I think it's Mitch Marner. Yeah. Because of his no trade that pops up July 1st. Yeah. Um, Austin Matthews is going to be going into the last year of his contract July 1st or July 5th. What the hell's the difference? Right. Now, if it's January, you got a different story. But I I think those are the priorities for me. The more I've thought about it, it's GM, coach, Marner. All right. Well, a couple of coaching and hires this week already. Um, the Nashville Predators name Andrew Burnett as their head coach, replacing John Hines, who was officially fired by Barry Trotz, the new general manager on Tuesday. So Trotz getting some work done. We'll get your thought on Bruno and the fit with the Preds. I think it's excellent. I, I do. And I Look, I think I mentioned this the last time we met on the podcast. I know he interviewed very, very strong with the Columbus Blue Jackets. And he interviewed elsewhere around the NHL. But he lands in Nashville, an organization that he's very familiar with. Spencer Carberry, formerly of the Toronto Maple Leafs, assistant to Sheldon Keefe, named head coach of the Washington Capitals. So start with Bruno first and uh, why that's a, a good hire by Barry Trotz. Well, Barry Trotz has known Andrew Brunette since he was leading the American League in scoring, um, playing in the Nashville or playing in the Washington organization where he started. And then he went to Nashville. And at that time, um, Trotz basically kicked Bruno in the ass and said, are you just going to be a player or do you want to be an NHL player? Hmm. And so, you know, I know Bruno really well. Um, He's a, he's a humble guy. He's a, an amazing personality. He's got the, you know, he loves to laugh, loves, loves, loves the game. Mm-hmm. He'll let you think that he's not a detailed guy. He'll let you think that. <laughs> and it doesn't bother him, but he is. He told, mm-hmm. and he's, he said that what he learned last year in Florida, a first time head coach, is something he's thought about a lot. Now, he knew, and you know, and he'll speak about it, I'm sure, at the press conference. But because somebody will ask him, but he knew where, you know, what needed to happen in Florida. You can't. But they had 122 points. You're not going to change it on the fly. You don't have no. You know, everybody could see the roster wasn't balanced. Everybody could see that, man. They won a whole bunch of games after extra time, you know, in overtime and shootouts. It, they all could see it, but you got to change it. So yeah. they went to Paul Maurice and that's clearly been the right choice in Florida. Bruno will do a good job. I, yeah. I'm biased, of course, because he was my left winger. He was a slower <laughs> skater than me. 
which made me really happy. <laughs> um, but he and Barry Trotz have known each other for come on 30 years. Yeah. And so that was a natural fit. I, for John Hines' sake, I think John's a really good coach. I wish it could have been done more cleanly mm. and, and, and a little more quickly. Uh, yeah. The same thing happened in Florida with Brunette last year. I wish that could have been done more clearly. You're not sitting in those meetings, so you don't know why it wasn't done yeah, a little more right. quickly. But this is where they're at, and he he fits Bruno fits in in Nashville. That gets us to Spencer Carberry, who, you know, like most assistant coaches, has a low profile, but extremely well thought of. Anytime mm-hmm. his name came up somewhere, people were like, "Oh, he's sharp. He yeah. knows the game. He knows." He's a great communicator. He's going into an interesting spot, mm-hmm. which is what I, you know, it's the same. It's funny. Crosby and Ma, or Crosby and Ovechkin came in at the same time and they're going to go out at the same time. And their franchises have kind of gone through the same thing, but you've got to coach the team while these legends are still there and you can't rebuild or you won't yeah. rebuild while they're there. And so Carberry goes into that and, how do you shape a team that's going to change quite significantly? Because you're not going to rebuild. No, not with OV. You can't. No. Well, it'll be interesting to see how oh, Brian McClellan, the general manager of the uh, Washington Capitals, tries to to reshape that. And Spencer Carberry, I mean, he he's suited for that role in that you know he's an offensive thinking coach. There's no doubt about that. And likewise with Burnett in uh, in Nashville and that's one of the the big attractive qualities that Barry Trotz was looking for to just inject a little bit of more offensive push in that Preds attack all right to Calgary Ray uh, and the Flames newly minted general manager Craig Conroy and his staff are in full coach interview mode this week started in earnest on Monday and they've got a full week this week uh, so some of the names that have popped out include Gerard Gallant, maybe Travis Green if Travis isn't scooped up by somebody else, right? I mean, you've got Anaheim that seems to be quiet, kind of laying in the weeds. What's Columbus doing? They've got some internal candidates like Pascal Vincent, who, you know, uh, people are talking about as they should. But Calgary also has those options. If if they don't want to look at Gallant or Travis Green, say, you know, you've got Kurt Muller, you've got Mitch Love, who did a nice job of the Calgary Wranglers, you've got Ryan Huska, who's there. And as I mentioned on Insider Trading on Tuesday, Mark Savard is a long shot consideration. There would be reservations to whether or not he's ready to be an NHL head coach. I mean, you're jumping from the Ontario Hockey League uh, to an NHL head coaching job. Feels like a bit of a stretch, but that name was thrown at me as someone to consider as being part of the mix. So when you think of all the struggles that the Flames went through, is there an experienced guy that maybe pops off the page more so for you? Well, I uh, I mean, Gerard Gallant, yes, but because you've just, you you know, you led it that way and in, yeah, uh, yeah, in an yeah. experienced way. Um, but, but here's, so I got a couple of thoughts on this, Dregs, one of them sure. being money. And they're paying Daryl Sutter to to live on the ranch. Next couple of years are like over eight million dollars. So I yeah. I mean that's gotta be a consideration, doesn't it, in Calgary? It has like to you, be. You're not gonna you don't want to pay your head coach ten million dollars. Right. And so does that take somebody out of the mix? Does that take a gallant out of the mix? I don't know. I do know it's always seems to be hard for the assistant to move over six feet and be the head coach. Yeah. It, it always is a is a really difficult transition. And so in in my gut, not knowing, you know, that takes out Huska and Muller for me. Yeah. Yeah. Because of that transition. Although maybe it doesn't. Maybe they know internally that's okay. Would you promote Mitch Love? Yeah. They seem to have a team that the window is more immediate. Right, like it, it seems like it should be a better team. It, it, does that mean a guy that's going to learn on the job a little bit is the wrong guy? Yeah. These all must be things bouncing around in Craig Conroy's head about mm-hmm. how do we how do we find what we think is the right guy now? But I I, I would lean a little bit more experience wise here than I would say in Columbus or in Anaheim. I, right. I would be more right. willing 
to grow there a little bit. Okay. I do think Travis Green is going to get one of those jobs, though. Well, and deservedly so, right? I mean, not just a, a friend of Ray and Dregs here, but a good ho- hockey coach, and he deserves to get back on a bench. I've, I'm also, we've touched on it, and, and again, we'll drift into next week on some of this stuff because I think there's going to be clarity with Mike Babcock as well. Uh, the Columbus Bla- Blue Jackets were high on on Mike Babcock and, and his return to the National Hockey League. So maybe by next week we'll we'll have a better indication as to whether that's reality or there's something else up Babcock's sleeve. So he's always intriguing, right? And the stories always seem to follow him. So we'll have to uh, investigate. Likewise with Kyle Dubas, we're not going to get into what's going on with Pittsburgh because we may have clarity on that here uh, on Wednesday as we're recording or later this week. So that'll give us some meat to Going to chew on uh, next week's Rain Dregs. Quick setup of the Stanley Cup final. And we'll keep this brief as we wrap up headlines because we've got Abbott and Lawless who are both going to join us to dive a little bit deeper into the Stanley Cup championship. Um, is it Vegas's time? Can we put it that simple? Just based, and, and that sounds absurd when you consider they've only been around for six seasons. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. Is it their time? I mean, right. There's a lot um, of cities that would tell you to take a yeah. jump off. Yeah. yeah, but based on look, I mean, you, you were invested in that Western Conference Final, right? So you you had a front row seat to how good, if not great, the Golden Knights can be. Um, I, I saw them play three of those six games at a level that Dallas just couldn't keep up to. Yeah. And even though Game One went to overtime, Vegas was in control of that all the way. Game four was, or game three was a disaster for Dallas. It went wrong right from the the moment the game started, but Vegas was totally dominant. And game six was even more so. Yeah. Here's the thing. I, I think Vegas is going to win this series. Okay. But yeah. I wouldn't look past anything, and I don't discount anything that Florida's done. This is not a fluke. They've When they got by Boston, I probably leaned a little bit. Oh, yeah, they caught lightning in a bottle. They got... They got really great goaltending. They got a, all these breaks. You know, they scored late in game seven. They had the Bobrovsky save in game five to keep it to overtime. Everything went their way. And then I kind of thought they'd fizzle, but they didn't. And yeah. now this is too long of sustained good play to look past Florida. However, I think this is a relatively short series, but I think it is really close. Like it, to me, it seemed and feels a lot like the Carolina series where yeah. I think it was 10 to 6 in goals 4 and against, and it was overtime, overtime, four seconds left. Like that series could have been 2 2. It's not. That's all Florida's good stuff. I think Vegas is going to win this, but it's going to be really, really close. Like the games will be very close. I just think Vegas is too big. Vegas is enormous strikes. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I can't even think of a – the smallest guy on that team is Jonathan Marsh or so, and he's built like a fire hydrant, <laughs> right? And so everybody else is just monstrous. Their defense is huge. Yeah. If guys want – if you want to watch one player that's way under the radar there, it's really great for Vegas, it's Nick Haig. Mm-hmm. That guy is a – he is a legit top three defenseman. He's huge. He skates well. I really thought he was excellent in that series. Well, much more ahead on the Stanley Cup final. Those are your headlines. Thank you to Tim Hortons.